Um, I wanted to to thank Christine from NASA headquarters for helping facilitate this, making the contact with this group. Uh, unknown to me until um, Hank Margolis, a new program manager at, at headquarters in terrestrial ecology, said that this would be a good forum for me to present some of my work in Siberia. So here I am. Um, I'd like to recognize some of my collaborators. Um, watching Sun, University of Maryland at College Park. He actually sits here at Goddard with us, um, has done a lot of work with me in, in mostly boreal forests for the last 20, 25 years. Also, Slava Haruk from a uh, Siberian institute called the Sukhachev Institute of Forests, long-term, long-time collaborator with him and the one who really makes these expeditions into Siberia possible by working the logistics side of things, first-rate scientist, forest ecologist in his own right. And also recognize Paul Montesano and Chris and I, a couple younger scientists here at Goddard that hopefully will, will take this work into the future. And um, what I'm here to talk about basically is the type of work we're doing in Siberia, um, studying the boreal forest and, and also that part that's included above the Arctic Circle. So we'll go to the first slide. Um, by the way, for those people who are downloading this presentation, there should be 18 slides in this. I'll try to remember to tell you what number I'm on. Okay, I have to tell you a little bit about NASA and why we're interested in, in studying for us. And uh, we do have a carbon cycle and ecosystems focus area, which is made up of a bunch of different program elements from ecosystems and biogeochemistry cycles, land cover dynamics, bio biodiversity, and of course, the aspects of the carbon cycle that interface with terrestrial ecosystems. So that's where this, this work originates. Overall, we want to understand how ecosystems and biogeochemical cycles connected with all of these different components are working together with an idea of, of getting a handle on the carbon budget and also be able to look at and understand what we're seeing on the ground through satellites and also field measurements, as you'll see, as well as being able to predict uh, the future state of our ecosystems. And there's a whole bunch of, of questions that are posed as part of this program, and I put check marks by five of them that, that this work actually relates to, and I will not go over those. You can, you can do that um, if you would like to later on. So we're looking at global Arctic boreal forests. We've done some global mapping type studies, which I'll show you later on. And we know that there's a lot of northern forests, the high latitude forests, quite a bit of that is above the Arctic Circle. And that's what that dashed blue line is supposed to represent. People who downloaded the presentation, that blue line got moved somehow, but I put it back where it belonged for this presentation. So you're welcome to move it back where it belongs. Um, anyway, the idea being there's, there's a huge store of carbon in the trees as well as in the soil in these regions, and it does overlap with the Arctic. It's an area that's subject to accelerated warming, as we see in, the, in those orangish maps in the second panel there, um, the current situation, and what we forecast into the future. It's just only going to get hotter faster in this area of high latitude. And of course, I'm sure that's why this group is together to figure out what kind of research strategies we need to, to understand it all, because it's a very complex, very interdisciplinary uh, endeavor for sure. But along with that increased temperature, we also expect changes in precipitation. And according to this IPCC simulation, it's, it's going to get wetter up in the Arctic too. So what is going to happen? Well. There's a lot of scenarios that have been worked. Uh, most of them don't tend to agree right now. So what we're trying to do is look at what's happening right now and then 
get enough information and data to, to be able to help the modelers um, improve their simulations. So I'm going to the, the next, the next, oh, oh I, I forgot, I got a couple animations in here. So I'm gonna go back just to, just to say that, that about a quarter of the, the world's forests are in the boreal zone and 25% of that in Siberia it has not been harvested. So we have a situation in Siberia especially where we have this mostly undisturbed by man tract of forest and it's immense. So it's sort of like what we're seeing is probably related to climate because it's not necessarily being uh, caused by man directly. So I'm on the next slide, as promised. Why are we studying the Siberian forests? They're huge. They're a composite of what the Russians call the dark needle taiga and the, the deciduous needle forest or larch forest. Uh, the larch area is also immense, spans the northern latitudes from the Urals to the Pacific Ocean. And it's a single uh, species, well, a single um, larch with, with, some, with some different speciation across the, the larch area, but basically deciduous conifer. It's in that area of increased warming, as I mentioned. And a key thing, of course, we know that much of northern Siberia and the Arctic is underlain by permafrost, and it is subject to thawing and it has impacts on everything, carbon, water, energy cycles, and the habitats of, of humans and animals up there. And there's comparatively few measurements are available in this region. If you look at the body of work that's been going on in the northern areas, uh, a lot of emphasis in Alaska for sure, and more to come, um, Europe, and in some places in Russia, but not necessarily in Siberia. It's a hard place to get to, a uh, hard place to get measurements for. So briefly, things that, that, that have been found in Siberia, we're seeing an increase in large growth in the, in the northern part of Siberia. We're seeing advancing tree lines into the northern and alpine forest tundra ecotone. We're also, seeing kind of the opposite, a decline and higher mortality of the dark needle conifer species in the south. We're not seeing that with the larch so far. Um, we're also seeing an increase in frequency and size of forest fires. And also along with that comes increased potential for insect outbreaks, which can be huge in, in Siberia, as well as even some landslides that we're beginning to look at as well. So I'm going to the next slide. This is a composite uh, slide here of some Landsat analysis we did for Arimoth, which is, means forest island in Russian. And it's the farthest north latitude stand of trees. I guess it kind of ties with another one up there, but this, this is the one we looked at. But, um, so it's really in the extreme northern limit of tree growth. So we're just looking at the difference between 73 and 2002, and we're actually gonna put another one on here too uh, soon. But we're just seeing an overall increase in the cover detected by satellite uh, in, the, in the tundra. And this, so that little circle there is, is the image showing the, the places that changed. And so that circle just shows where the tundra is. 4% increase. The ecotone area or that transition, almost 30% increase. And then in the forest, so-called um, dense forest, which is only around 30% cover, it, it increased by 4%. So even back several years ago, we were seeing changes like this occurring. Um, if this is happening across the ecotone, it's a significant change. So it's happening at the extreme part. There's a good chance that it's happening in lots of other places in that ecotone. And that just happens to be over 13,000 kilometers in length if you were to do the circumpolar ecotone. 
and this is just a composite satellite image looking with the clouds masked out, um, looking down on the North Pole area, of course. Okay, I'm on uh, the next slide. Now, unfortunately, I don't have numbers on my screen here, so that's not going to help us. This, this slide is four, four photos. One is a, just a, a slide showing, a picture showing Airy Moss and the sort of the, the distribution of the, the forest there. The one directly to the right is Krumholtz stands of Siberian pine. Now, this is down in the southern part of Siberia that are changing right to their erect form. Right out of this Krumholtz, we're getting a change in the form and structure of the Siberian pine at, at high elevations. Something's changing. The bottom left picture is a large forest with reproduction coming in that happens also to be Siberian pine. So that Siberian pine, which is a more southerly species, is starting to move into areas of large dominance. Now the other the photo on the, the lower right is a record it, it saved in the trees of the fires in a particular area. So we do look at, at tree rings to look at fire history, fire occurrence. Okay, I'm gonna to move to the next slide, which is a, a map showing where our, our current field work is. Uh, Northern Russia, between the, the Ninji Tunguska River on the south and the Arctic Sea to the north. And the, the pictures just show some of the, the landscape. Um, it's tough to grow as a tree up there in those areas, but a lot of trees do, and they do burn, which is what that upper panel shows, that, that dead hillside of burned trees. Um, the response to tree growth in the middle picture there of, a, of severe climate impact and um, at the bottom is a change in something here, like warming soils is producing a situation where the shallow rooted larch are losing their footing and tipping over, and it's the, the classical drunken forest type of scenario. So we're seeing all of those different things uh, as, we, as we go out into these areas to make measurements. Uh, how we do that is we go to an airport up in northern Siberia load a bunch of gear on a helicopter, as you see this MI-8 helicopter in the lower uh, left of the, this particular slide. Um, above that, you see the type of terrain as we're flying in, and you see that gravel bank over in the lower right of the picture. That's where we're gonna land, and there's our camp that we set up. So we, we, we uh, are on those, those rocks and things, makes for interesting overnight, but uh, it, it works. And then, We'll make measurements at this spot for a couple, three days, and then we'll move downstream using these boats we brought along with us that you see on, on the lower right picture. So that's how we get around because there are no roads up there in the summertime especially. There are ice roads that are sometimes used in the vicinity, but not, uh, not any kind of all-weather roads. Um, next slide just shows more pictures about what we're finding there, some examples of, of the type of trees that we're measuring. There's, there's a, somebody making a DBH measurement. There's our field crew in the middle, the top middle picture, posing by our boats. Uh, we do encounter wildlife, including moose, and um, we've seen footprints of wolves and bears and other such things, but haven't directly encountered those yet. But as we're uh, exploring this area, we do see evidence of change. We're seeing a lot of landslides along the river, and that's in the lower left. There's an example of that. More drunken forest in the middle, lower panel, and then a recent burn that uh, is there on the, on the lower right. And an example of the type of measurements that we're acquiring, this is this middle graph here is just a tree height plotted with uh, diameter breast height of the large trees and a, a relationship. So you can actually see real data that came out of these, these field studies. And here's some more real data on the next slide where we see uh, histograms of number of trees and size of the, the bowl in terms of diameter and, and height. And it goes from the bottom panel is in Western Siberia, which is farther south in that dark needle conifer and up toward the top, you go farther north. So those distributions change 
just do the latitude and the topography mainly. You see the range of above ground biomass, AGB, there in the top right graph. Uh, low biomass in the upper reaches of Siberia, as one would expect. A much larger biomass as you go south. And uh, um, so we're, we're just trying to acquire as much of this type of structure data as possible. In addition, our Russian colleagues have permission to cut some trees and take these wafers back to their dendro lab, and so they're looking at the tree ring analysis. And what we're seeing here is, is, is very interesting to me. This, this cross section of a large tree was growing near a river bank. Something happened in the soil um, about 30 years or so ago that promoted growth. So it went from rings that you could hardly tell apart to rings that are on the order of a centimeter annual growth. That's, to me, that's really remarkable, that there's all this huge growth potential in these large trees up there. What they need is probably a deeper root system to provide more nutrients and moisture. Um, the light's not going to change, but the, but the soil those trees are in could change and could actually uh, change the growth dynamics just based on this, this one example that we saw. The typical tree rings you see plotted down below, which are on the order of a millimeter or two per year. So I'm going to the next one um, and um, just briefly mention, not to go over these in much detail, is that using that tree ring with analysis uh, we can also look at growth trends in response to um, temperature, for example, like the, the, the panel of four graphs at the bottom show tree ring width, which is TRW, over the annual temperature, and there's a significant trend there in all of those. In addition, the, that tree ring data was related to gross primary productivity estimated by satellite. So we see that trend in that data as well. So it is a measurable phenomenon that we're, that we're seeing on the ground. It's measurable from far away up, at, up from our space-borne satellites. So it, it gives us uh, confidence that that we can develop the techniques from satellite to, uh, to move forward with this and really understand the, the growth dynamics. In addition to the, the tree ring analysis for growth, we're also looking at fire return intervals. Just look, because in these tree rings, there are embedded to fire scars. The tree has the ability to, to heal over those and preserve them, and so when they're exposed, you have an interval in the years by the number of rings between fire scars to develop the fire return interval. And so this was a, a study done um, a little bit farther to the south uh, in Siberia, and it just shows there's an impact on the, the fire return interval depending on the topography, what kind of environmental conditions these trees are growing in, and um, but we're seeing a trend, or a difference, I should say, not, not, not a trend with two points like that, but 19th century versus 20th century. What you can't see on the slide, unfortunately, is that the blue are the mixed taiga forests and the red are large forests. So they're both decreasing their fire return interval, meaning less time between fires, between the 19th century data and the 20th century data. Okay, I'm going to move on down to the next one, show you a couple of quick examples of what we're trying to do from, from satellite. This, this image here is a percent cover of the forest tundra ecotone circumpolar based on the MODIS instrument that NASA has as part of their EOS program. Um, a group from the University of Maryland made a percent 
cover product called VCF. And so we just compared that, we, we compared that with some measurements that we got from high resolution satellite imagery to validate it and then applied it over this area. And so this is the type of map that we were able to get. The idea to start a benchmark process or to establish a benchmark for for this type of work to continue on in, in the future. The next one is a, a map of circumpolar biomass that we put together by combining LIDAR height measurements of trees using the GLASS satellite with that MODIS VCF product, putting those together along with whatever ground data or air, aerial data that we had to serve as a record of, of what's, what's happening on the ground or what the measurements on the ground. The thing that we discover here, I think that, that is not surprising, is that because it's so hard to get measurements in Siberia, our uncertainties are really large. So the, the, the message is we have to find, we have to get more measurements, we have to find ways to get detailed information um, in that area to try to improve our estimates. And then we'll go down to the, the next one which shows a whole bunch of satellites that are in orbit and collecting data now. And I just put circles around those that we are using or plan to use very soon. And they, they, um, they cover all aspects essentially of active and passive remote sensing. Um, we're also looking at the successors I just uh, brought up some information on the upper left of the slide. Um, we started off with AVHRR back in the 70s and 80s, and we're transitioning through the EOS period with, with the MODIS data. And now we're going to have, um, have the, the NOAA series, the, the joint polar satellite system, and the VIR satellite. So we're gonna be transitioning to that. A lot of really interesting work was done with the LIDAR on board the ISAT satellite for FOREST. A lot of good stuff on ICE, but some really interesting stuff on FOREST. We see some of that work transitioning to ISAT-2 up in these high latitudes. Uh, some radar work from a Japanese satellite, uh, a lot of that's done. We produced biomass maps of, uh, of Siberia with, with radar, as other folks have as well. Uh, and we're looking forward to NASA's uh, NISAR mission, which is joint with the Indian Space Agency. And then finally, we have now a, a way to get high resolution satellite data from our commercial vendors that has been purchased already by the US government, and therefore it's being made available at no cost to other government agencies. So for those people who are looking for a source of that data, um, there is a, a there is a program, and I can give you the information if you want to contact me uh, sometime after this. And then this is an example of those type of data. You can, if you get more than one image of an area, you can do stereo photogrammetry from space and come up with forest structure in three dimensions. And this this colored image here shows the typical pattern of of low forest out on the, the hill slopes away from this river. There's a river that goes right through the middle of this. And those that red area are the tall trees that like to grow along the river. And it, it gives you a three-dimensional picture of, of what's going on there. So we see that as, a, as an op opportunity to help augment our field measurements as, as we you know, make that transfer of, of understanding from what we're seeing on the field to this type of data, and then we can move on to another type of remote sensing to, to do the whole of Siberia. And I think that brings me to the end. Yeah. So uh, really a quick end there. <laughs> okay, so I am done. I don't know if I left enough time for questions. I hope so. Yes, you, you definitely did, and, and I know I have several um, but before asking mine, I want to see if anyone um, else from the audience would like to ask questions of John. Uh, 
Uh, this is Sarah. I just wanted to let everybody know, a few of you I had um, muted because there was some background noise. Everybody is unmuted now. Hey, John, it's Brendan Rogers. Really nice presentation. Um, quick question about the stuff you showed with um, changing fire return intervals in the larch forest. And I was wondering how you guys accounted for stand replacing fires um, that obviously kill the trees and wouldn't, wouldn't leave fire scars in living trees. Um, by looking at the master chronology, we can match that up and know that that occurred. Okay, so there wasn't a case where there was a stand replacing fire that wiped out all the trees. They, at least some were, were left standing. Is that correct? Well, if, if I'm not sure I understand your question now. Um, there is evidence on the on these these um, areas that we go into that that obviously that there has been. Now, I really actually don't. <laughs> you you stumped me. I don't really know how to answer that question. Okay, no problem. Um, okay. Any Anything else? Yeah, this is Andrew. I'll ask one of mine now. Um, with respect to wildfire, um, the, the return interval change was, was impressive. Um, it looked like things are not quite happening quite twice as frequently as they were. Um, I'm also curious if you've begun any um, comparison with North American boreal forest yet. Um, obviously, there's an increase in, in wildfire in North America as well. And while um, certainly there are um, most of the same functional types, the, the community composition is, is pretty different between that part of Siberia and much of North American boreal forests. And um, have you thought about any comparisons there yet and changes in rate and frequency and that sort of thing? You know, we really, we're really focused in on Siberia because there's so little known there, um, and so have not, have not branched out to look at at the larger situation. I think we need to get more, more measurements. I know that um, actually, I know the Tree Ring Lab with Columbia was was. Uh, combing the boreal forest about 20 years ago. So they must have a pretty good record from, from, from what they were doing. But uh, as for us, we have not made that comparison. Okay, great. I, I also noticed that you, um, I, I was really appreciated that you mentioned the importance of tying in um, ground measurements. Um, over the years, once every once in a while, I noticed the misperception among people sometimes that when you're using satellite imagery, you, you have essentially synoptic measurements, which sometimes people mistake for not needing um, copious ground data to help constrain and, and improve your estimates. Um, and I'm wondering, um, do you have any suggestions, given that people now are trying to broker collaborations um, across different field sites to be able to have comparative data, do you have any suggestions for um, setting up collaborations internationally like, like that um, to be able to improve um, collection of ground truth data so it's comparable across different sites. That's, that's really a great idea. And, um, you know, I think the community sort of self-organizes, but it's not, they're, they're, I don't think there's a standard protocol. So, um, yeah, it, it's something that, that we should look at doing if somebody else isn't doing it already and I just don't know about it. Like the Woods Hole guy, guys should know, they, they get all around the world. Um, so, Brandon, do you know, is there is there anything like this going on? I'm um, sorry, I had to check out for, for a minute. Can you uh, provide quick more context? Well, Andrew asked the question about about organizing globally in terms of measurement protocols for field measurements mm -hmm. specifically. We're wondering, is anything like that happening yet where where scientists from diverse groups are getting together and trying to just to uh, do consistent measurements so they're easy to compare and, and use globally? 
Oh, that'd be uh, amazing, wouldn't it? Um, oh, so we're so we're um, for for NASA's above program that probably a lot of you know about. There is definitely a concerted effort to do that uh, between groups looking at similar projects. But of course, that's focused on um, Alaska and Western Canada, and it's you know it's going to be a balance between doing consistent measurements, but then of course every investigator is going to have their own particular needs for the kind of data they want to collect. Um, mm -hmm. But but it's a certainly a good point, uh, and especially with with all the planning and the yeah the extra trouble it takes to as you well know to do stuff in Russia and Siberia, um, it, there really is a need for for more more measurements, both the productivity stuff you're showing, and in terms of fire and combustion, some of the things that we look at. Um, and when you yeah when you gather it all together, that's it's a lot of different measurements and a lot of different protocols, and it's. Um, adds a lot of noise. So I think that'd be something that'd be great to work towards, for sure. Yeah, part of the reason I asked that question is because I, I wonder if there might be a, a nice, concise role there for IARPIC and, and then extending that maybe through the IASC working groups. It, it's, it seems like a contained enough issue having ground truth in general, but specifically for um, cross-cutting remote sensing that that might be something we could we could take advantage of that we already have these um, organizational bodies to maybe approach it. Yes, I, I, I think so. So I, I don't want to hog the, the airspace. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, John, I, I had one more. It's Brendan again. I was, uh, you showed a nice photo of some Siberian pine um, in the understory of a larch forest, and I was wondering what your thoughts on sort of the controls for that, and if you think that was a, what you're looking at as a natural change, a change, in, change in forest type. Do you think the Siberian pine will sort of eventually take over the larch in that region, and if so, why? Is it, is it the fire hasn't come through? Is it that it's warming and permafrost is, yeah, you know, the active layer is getting thicker, that kind of thing? I think that as, as the Siberian pine outcompetes the, the larch, yeah, it will take over. Um, and other things, too, uh, the, the firs and, 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 um, and spruces. Um, but what's happening now, and that, by the way, that, that is an area that, that that regeneration came in on its own. And Siberian pine has, an, has a very nice advantage in terms of being able to, to uh, expand its, its range because of this, uh, this bird that the Russians call a, a cedar bird, but it's a, well, not but, it's, a, it's actually a nutcracker. Like we have the Jay, uh, sorry, Clark's nutcracker in the West U.S. Anyway, they'll pick up these these Siberian pine cones, which have nuts in them, like a pinion nut, and they will carry them several kilometers and actually bury them to, to have a store of food for later. So they're actually going around planting the Siberian pines in the adjacent areas. So it has that, that competitive advantage of getting started. But what it doesn't have is resistance to fire like larch does. So if a fire, ground fire goes through there, it'll probably wipe out the regeneration and the larch will remain. And that will maintain itself until um, something changes in the, in the fire regime or um, the larch no longer can compete. So, you know, it's a process. That's, <laughs> it's complicated, but uh, I think that's, Certainly, one of the things that, that we have to consider as far as the expansion of the, the Siberian pine. So, sorry, that was a long story. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really interesting. I didn't, I wasn't aware of the the bird and the the advanced dispersal mechanism that the pine has. It's really, it's really neat to think about in terms of uh, changing forests. Um, yeah. It's, it's especially useful for, for going uphill, if you can imagine, that gravity wants to take seeds downhill, but these birds will fly uphill, it doesn't bother them. So it, it, and, and, we're, and of course, in the southern part of Siberia, the, the Siberian pines are moving uphill, but of course we're seeing that in parts of Europe and, and other places with different species. 
Do, do you know, uh, I think it's Nadia Chebakova, I'm probably really butchering the name, but she has done um, several projections of um, forest types in the future using a bioclimatic model. Do you know in that region, is that kind of what, what those projections are showing, is the increase in Siberian pine and firs? Um, no, I'm not, I'm sorry, I don't know that study. Um, okay. But I think that the, what I do know is is that if, if you go on the tops of the the area of of northern Siberia where we're working is is the trap area. If you're mil anybody familiar with that, it's essentially a shield volcano eruption of 250 million years ago that went on for a million years and built up these kilometers thick deposits of basalt, and then over time those have been dissected, and so you have these river valleys. But you have these flat top mountains. And and where we're going, the flat top mountains are tundra and the trees kind of go up the sides. So it gives a nice it gives a nice uh um, opportunity to study the, the change in the forest with with uh latitude. So as as at the top of these you can find the remnants of trees that lived before the Little Ice Age in the Middle Ages. And so these big tree trunks are just laying there. They don't get decomposed because it's so dry and cold up there. But now the larch is beginning to grow in in those regions. So I think the progression is for the larch to move to the Arctic Ocean where it used to be and things that were in the south are going to move to the north where they used to be, but I don't know where the where the lines of Siberian pine and spruce stopped as far as the northward, you know, in, in times before when in a, under a warmer scenario. So I, I don't know that, but it would be interesting to see that study. But we're now seeing the large come in at higher elevations. Okay, I'd, I'd like to relay a question from Dave Swanson of the Arctic Network National Park Service. Uh, he's asking, how did you acquire the Worldview stereo coverage and do you know what software was used to develop the 3D model? Yeah, um, the, the software we use is, is the AIM stereo pipeline and they actually have a system for taking, taking these stereo pairs from, from Worldview and processing the 3D models. We're, um, we're also using similar software on some computers here at Goddard. The data itself, we get through an agreement with the um, Defense Department who purchased a lot of these data from NGA, National Geospatial Agency, and they make a lot of this data now available to government researchers. Um, a fellow who works here, Chris and I, in fact, he's one of, one of the collaborators here, wrote a paper describing that in, in the EOS magazine of uh, AGU. And his la you can look that up. His last name is spelled N-E-I-G-H. And I think it was, it might have been 2011. It's, it's been a few years. And, um, one can get the details and and figure out how to do that. We'll, we provide that service for for NASA investigators here in, in our branch, and Chris is, is one of the key guys who knows about that. Um, other agencies might be working with him or, or have their own conduit in. But I will say that if you're working with above, above is going to have all of the High resolution satellite data available through the um, sorry, I think it's the national it's University of Minnesota Geospatial Laboratory. It's run by Paul Moran. And the Polar he, Geospatial Center. Sorry? It's, it's called the Polar Geospatial Center. So Bob is working with the Polar Geospatial Center to make a high resolution imagery available for above researchers. Um, through through NASA, we're, we've developed a system to allow um, researchers that are part of above to use that use that data set. 
And I bet that was Liz Hoy who just told us that. That's Liz Hoy, yep. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, uh, you know, Dave, maybe that answers his question coming from Alaska. I, I, I think it probably does. I, I think I can connect the dots here that, oh, yep, he says yes. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, having worked a little bit with AIM Stereo Pipeline myself, I, I was um, I was impressed with the results. It, it's it's a good tool for that. 